Hello friends. We are all excited to be here today because the topic of today's lecture has mystified human beings for eternity. The universe with its stars and mystical bodies has attracted not only scientists, but artists, filmmakers, and poets. We are all drawn to this mystery of what is beyond. Today, we will be taken on a journey to this magical world by Professor Rajaram Nityanand, a renowned physicist and Infosys Prize juror. So I've chosen the theme of gravity as one of the basic physical forces which uh, governs astronomical bodies. Of course, there's more to astronomy than gravity, but I'd like to focus on that. So I first of all <laughs> want to distinguish between gravity in lowercase and gravity in uppercase. So the little g, which is what is keeping you rooted to your chairs, uh, is uh, this number. And the man who gave it to us, of course, is uh, Galileo. Okay. One way of thinking of this number is that if something falls for one second, it's going as fast as Usain Bolt. You can figure that out. But this is something very specific to the Earth. Okay. Now, what uh, gravity with an uppercase is something which is universal. Uh, you have to take this number, which is called Newton's constant, multiply by the two masses so that it, the kg square cancels, and uh, of course divide by the square of the distance, and then you get the force. And the unit is naturally called Newton. <laughs> but this looks like a very small force, and it is. If you just do, took two masses, which are one kg, and put them one meter apart, and of course somewhere in outer space, so they don't fall down, they would gradually uh, come and meet each other in about one day. Okay, So I brought along a picture of Newton, which you may not have seen before. Uh, this is by the poet William Blake. Uh, this was not meant to be a compliment to Newton. <laughs> the point he was trying to make is, here is this man with this fantastic intellect who is obsessed with mathematics, describing the world scientifically, and the entire beauty of the natural world is lost to him. Um, I hope to convince you that that's not entirely true, that you can use this capital G and uh, uh, learn about a lot of beautiful things. So let's start with planetary orbits. So if uh, any of you go to a school to popularize astronomy, uh, the first thing they will ask you is, why doesn't the Earth fall into the sun if there is an attraction? And uh, the answer is, of course, it would if you just let it go, but it's moving sideways. Okay at a pretty decent speed of 30 kilometers per second. And therefore, it moves in this orbit. And you could even argue that it is actually falling, because you know, if the sun was not there, it would be going in the straight line. It's because of the sun that it's fallen by this much. Uh, regarding the orbit, I've had this experience of showing a student the Jupiter and its moons through the telescope. He was very excited. Then he said, but where's the orbit? Because all the pictures he had seen of Jupiter had a line going through it. Now I come, I think in this place I need not be embarrassed to show equations. Okay, So here is what is uh, uh, taught in uh, typically the 11th and 12th, that uh, the quantity on the left is the acceleration of something moving in a circular orbit, and the quantity on the right is uh, the force. Okay, um, It's interesting that the same equation can be written in other ways, and I wish they did it in the, because each of them is uh, so here is the same thing. I mean, I was just moving one r to the other side, and then it tells you uh, this fact that uh, when this thing is orbiting in a circle, say the Earth going around the Sun, its kinetic energy is half the potential energy. And I mentioned the sign because conventionally this potential energy is negative, which means if you had to move the Earth from its orbit to infinity, you would have to give a certain amount of energy. And right now, the energy it has is only half of that. So that's why it's not going away. Why I'm mentioning this is this turns out to be a broader principle, which will be applicable to clusters of stars, galaxies, and so on. That if they are bound, if they are not expanding or contracting, the uh, kinetic energy is half the potential energy. So that the total is still negative. Okay? And the other interesting way to write this, and believe me, it is the same equation, when I simply replace the velocity by the circumference uh, divided by the time. Okay? So when you do that, uh, something very nice happens. 
uh, you get the square of the period proportional to the cube of the distance. And this is, of course, the famous uh, Kepler's uh, third law. And that was the clue which enabled Newton to arrive at the inverse square law. So he, he really went from the bottom to the top. Okay? But the other interesting remark one can make, you see the mass in the denominator and the cube of uh, the distance in the numerator. So this is something like the average density inside the orbit. So for example, uh, if you saw the movie Gravity, things in low Earth orbit are moving around with a period of 90 minutes. And if you just plug it into this formula, you can get the density of the Earth as you know, 5,000 kilograms per meter cubed. You don't need to know the mass and radius separately. And that, again, is a general principle. If things move with a certain period in a galaxy or in a cluster of stars, you can immediately find the mean density. And this will turn out to be very important toward the end of the talk. But the simple version with circular orbits doesn't really do justice to Kepler's achievement. And I'd like to spend a little bit on it. Because remember, he, he didn't have the privilege of being outside the solar system. He was on a planet, which was itself moving in an unknown orbit. He was looking at other planets, which were moving in their orbits. He knew, of course, the period with which they went around. And from this, he had to reconstruct the shapes of these orbits. And this is how he did it. It's, it's rather clever. He had access to this huge set of data taken by Tycho Brahe. So let's take that piece of data where Earth is here, Mars is here, and the Sun is here. So it's opposition. So if you like, uh, Mars is overhead at midnight. Okay, Wait for 687 days. So Mars has come back exactly to where it was before, but Earth has not. The Earth has completed one revolution, 365, and almost 90% of the next revolution. Okay, So the second time around, the Earth is here, and therefore you see Mars at a different angle. And you can see that these two observations will enable you to construct this triangle. Uh, of course, you don't know this distance, or Kepler didn't know this distance, but it doesn't matter. What you can do is construct this triangle and then repeat it. Wait for one more orbit of the Earth, right? One more, um, no, wait for 687 days more. And you notice you keep constructing this triangle and you get the orbit of the Earth. And that is what he found to be an ellipse, not a circle, right? Everyone was working with circles. And, and then once you know the motion of the platform on which you are moving, then you can use all the observations of the other planets to figure out their orbits. Okay? And uh, the other place where the textbook account oversimplifies Kepler, what I had on the previous uh, slide, was to simply say that the square of the period is the cube of the distance. What distance? If it's an ellipse, there are so many different distances you can define for an ellipse. He tried all of them and concluded that the relevant parameter is actually the major axis. Okay? So that's Kepler. But he succeeded because the planet moved in a fixed path and came back to the original point. Now, is this something we should take for granted? Um, wasn't clear in Kepler's time. In, in some sense, it was a mystical belief that there was a path which the planet had to follow. But that turns out that uh, when you actually work out the dynamics of a planet using Newton's laws, which Newton did, it's just because of the inverse square law that the orbit closes. And uh, to convince you that this is a bit of an accident, uh, you look at this figure, and you can see there are two kinds of uh, periodic motion here. One is an angle. This just goes around. And that has one period. But the other is that the distance is maximum, becomes a minimum, and again becomes a maximum. Okay. Now, it so happens the two periods are the same. Now, if it had not been inverse square law, the two periods would not have been the same. And then you would have had a situation uh, like this, where let's say it goes around. Next time, it doesn't retrace the same path, but moves, and the next time again. So this is what is called a precessing ellipse. So it's, it's a fortunate accident that the inverse square law gives rise to closed orbit. So number one, Kepler could solve for the orbit, and uh, Newton could create his theory. However, uh, in the solar system, once you start becoming more accurate, there are reasons why it's not just the inverse square law. Um, the most fundamental reason is that the gravity of the sun is not described by Newton's theory, but Einstein's theory. Okay? But there are other reasons. The planet Mercury, which has a very elliptical orbit, is also disturbed by the other planets. So you put in all those forces. It's not precisely the inverse square law, so you do get precession. Okay? So Mercury, for example, this major axis would turn by about one degree in 600 years. And 90% of that was accounted for by 1900, by including the effect of the other planets. 
remaining 10% required Einstein. It's a story I'd love to tell you, but uh, I'm sticking to Newtonian gravity, which is fascinating enough. Right. So now let's ask, how is this nice picture of orbits to be changed if you include the fact that, say, the Earth uh, is disturbed by Jupiter? Now, of course, Jupiter is pretty massive, but it's only 1,000th the mass of the sun. It's also further away, five times further away. So that's what gives you this factor of 1 over 25,000. And uh, most people would like to neglect 1 over 25,000. You say the sun is the main thing, and it orbits. But uh, what one has to keep in mind is that a small effect like 1 over 25,000, if it was cumulative with every orbit, could build up to a large effect in 25,000 orbits of the Earth, which is not that much, right, compared to human history or compared to the history of the Earth. So uh, the moment one moves to the next level of celestial mechanics, which I've called 501, you have to convince yourself that these tiny pushes which are given every orbit do not have a cumulative effect. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to do the mathematics, but it was done by, by the successors of Newton. Newton himself tried to solve for the motion of the moon, and he records that it gave him headaches. He had already achieved enough by that time by creating calculus and gravity. But his successors, mainly in France, were able to study the mutual influence of the planets and the good news is that, yes, these effects are there, but they are not cumulative. And there's another simpler way of convincing yourself of that. If they had been cumulative, then we would have either been cooked or frozen sometime in the 4 billion year history of the Earth. Okay? But that's not a mathematical proof. Uh, that's what today in science is called an anthropic proof. That you say such and such a thing must be true, because if it was not true, we would not be here. So uh, resonance is not a commercial for the Journal of Science Education that I work for. <laughs> it refers to a situation in which the effects might be cumulative. Okay? And the point is that if you uh, have the periodicities of two planets related by some integer, like say the two hands of a clock, which have a ratio of 1 is to 12, then the same configuration repeats again and again and again. And then you have to do the maths more carefully to make sure that it doesn't have some disastrous effect. Uh, it turns out that in some cases, this uh, commensurability of periods actually stabilizes the system. So one example are the satellites of Jupiter, a favorite uh, object for uh, amateur astronomers, the one that I tried to show the kid. It turned out that three of the most massive satellites have a period ratio of Exactly 1 is to 2 is to 4. Okay? Uh, this was discovered by uh, people who observed it, uh, starting from Galileo, and explained by Laplace that this was actually a stable configuration. The other stable configuration is more interesting. It's associated with the name of Lagrange. So I warned you, you're going to have some Frenchmen, uh, the successors of Newton in the next century. So I've shown these two configurations here. So this is Jupiter uh, viewed edge on, this one. So you have, I think, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and so on. And the periods are in the 1 is to 2 is to 4 ratio. Uh, and this is uh, Laplace looking benevolently down. But this is now the Earth-Moon system. So I'm fulfilling uh, Gurpreet's promise of taking you to the moon. <laughs> okay, But I'm taking you to uh, two more interesting places as well. So Lagrange. Uh, worked out, and it's, it's, it's a nice exercise. It's not that easy. That, uh, of course, the moon's going around the Earth, or both of them are going around a common center. And he found that there are five points where if you put another object, it will be in a stable orbit. Well, it'll be, it'll be in equilibrium. Let me not say stable. Okay? And naturally, they are named L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. And L4 and L5 are not on the line. So now it's a more interesting problem, where this is being attracted not to the Earth or to the Moon, but somewhere in between. But in spite of that, the forces all balance, including the centrifugal force. And these two points are actually stable. So uh, this attracted the attention of a Princeton physicist called Gerald O'Neill. He set up something called the L5 Society. Um, in some sense, he was selling real estate at L5. <laughs> but the idea, and it's a brilliant idea, and you can look it up on the internet. Not being, I think the society still exists. He proposed a cylindrical uh, spacecraft which would be pointed 
to the sun so that you would get your supply of energy. It would spin so that you would get your gravity. It would be lined with soil. You could have an atmosphere. It, it's still a great idea, actually. So I think it's more interesting than going to Mars. Um, now, L2 uh, has uh, astronomical significance as well. If you now think of this as uh, the Earth and the Sun, huh? rather than the Earth and the Moon, L2 is a point of equilibrium where, uh, in fact, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization plans to put a satellite to observe the Sun. It's called Aditya. It's being designed in the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore. And uh, in addition, you've all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, which uh, has done marvelous work for a long time, but it's dying. <laughs> and its successor is going to be put at the L2 point. L2 is unstable, but with a little push from rockets here and there, you know, one can. But uh, resonances can also destabilize. Okay? And uh, the classic example is uh, Saturn's rings, which, of course, looked just like a smooth ring. And then gradually, as telescopes improved, one gap was seen. But when the Voyager spacecraft went close to Saturn, uh, the color, by the way, uh, reflects the chemical composition. It's false color. Okay? And that changes as you move along the ring. But look at all the gaps. So those are all the orbits which were unstable. And the reason why they were unstable is, again, perturbations. If it had just been Saturn and the particles in the ring, that would have been fine. But there are these satellites of Saturn in particular, a satellite called en Enceladus. So anything which has a resonance with that, and I mean strange resonances, maybe 27 by 16 and so on, uh, uh, destabilizes those particles, and that part of the ring is uh, cleared out. OK? Now, uh, we can go beyond the solar system. I don't have time to tell you the exciting story of how uh, extrasolar planets have been discovered. I think the most recent count is some 2,635 or something like that, around a large number of stars. And some of the stars have a large number of planets. There are a couple of them which have seven planets around them. Nothing quite like our solar system. But in addition to things resembling our solar system, there are the oddballs, where the planets have highly eccentric orbits, so a rich variety. So this has uh, provided employment, because if you go on studying the solar system, at some point you might run out of problems. But now you have all these new planetary systems. So that's why I said uh, celestial mechanics, which are the people who work on such things, have now come up with uh, theories. They need to come up with theories to explain this whole range of systems. And some of them are very unsuitable to life if the orbit is uh, very eccentric and so on. And this has an interesting implication. It's not enough to find a planet with the right temperature and so on. That particular planetary system, along with its companions, maybe with a companion star, um, should be stable, dynamically stable. Okay? So this uh, may actually cut down. The Earth, fortunately, seems to live in this system, but no one has found another system quite like it. So there's this eternal debate in the uh, extraterrestrial <laughs> intelligence community saying, wh what's the probability of finding this? Uh, very uncertain still. Um, long ago, of course, people thought it was very small. Then all these planets were discovered. And initially, there's a lot of enthusiasm. But now there's a group of people who say, it's not just enough to have a planet. You need a lot of dynamical uh, things to be sorted out before you can have something going on for billions of years and giving rise to life. Yeah. So uh, I learned this phrase recently. It's called the rare earth doctrine, which does not refer to China stopping the su supply of gadolinium or something. It refers to the fact that the circumstances which prevailed on Earth may actually be rare, even though there are Earth-like planets everywhere. Of course, there's the other question, which uh, is beyond stellar dynamics. Even given exactly the same conditions, would life take the same course? Not obvious to me, because, for example, would we be here if some asteroid had not hit the Earth 63 uh, million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs? Uh, they might still be here. So actually, I find the rare Earth hypothesis uh, somewhat attractive, and uh, it means we should look after it. <laughs> the planetary mechanics is getting a bit complicated, so let's go to something simple. <laughs> okay? So this is a globular cluster. It has a couple of hundred thousand stars, uh, pretty much like you know, TCS, Wipro, or Infosys. <laughs> right? <laughs> And uh, the surprise is that uh, 
It's actually a simpler system to understand, even though it has so many particles. And the reason is that at some point, when the number of particles increases, like the molecules in this room, physicists throw up their hands, and they say, we are not going to describe the particles individually. We are going to look at their statistical uh, collective behavior. Okay? So this particular one is called M13. The 101 stands for the course level. Okay? Uh, credit for the image to an amateur. Um, of course, he is professional to the extent you can buy good prints of his picture on the net. So I already told you this. They're held together by their own gravity. Uh, their size is about 100 light years. And uh, there are about 100 of them in our galaxy. So the nearest ones are about 1,000 light years away. Um, when I came to Bangalore, one could uh, see one of them with the naked eye from NAL, where I was, in the south, uh, and even M13. Uh, it's surprisingly easy to model the system, and that's the point I'd like to. Uh, you have to think statistically, first of all, right? So don't worry about all these pairs of interactions between stars. Just look at the whole cluster as a smooth, spherical distribution of matter. Work out what the force is, and because it's spherical, it points to the center. By the way, looking at just one globular cluster, you can't conclude it's spherical. It might be circular and just facing you. But if all 100 of them look circular, then it's, it's a conspiracy or they are all spherical. Okay. So once you have a force acting toward the center, the technology had been developed by Newton, Laplace, Lagrange to work out the orbits. But there's an added twist. In the solar system, you knew that the dominant force was the force of the sun. Here, it's a more democratic system. Um, you, uh, the force comes from the stars, the force is felt by the stars. So you can call it a catch-22. You can't find out one without the other. But it's something that uh, anyone who works on large numerical problems learns how to cope with. You make a guess as to what the distribution of the density is, and uh, then you work out the orbits, populate the orbits, see if it gives you back the same uh, distribution. If not, you keep correcting it. Okay? In fact, the history is that a Princeton professor called Martin Schwarzschild was mo modeling galaxies, not global clusters. Uh, he formulated the problem in this way, and then he sent his student to the economics department to bring back a linear programming uh, problem, which is exactly what you do, right? You give certain weights, and then you achieve certain objectives. But what might worry you, looking at this uh, dense concentration of stars, is, uh, is this picture of smooth orbits correct? Are they going to bump into each other? It looks very crowded. But that's partly because of the resolution of the telescope. Um, it's true the stars appear to overlap in the picture, but they're really very small. I mean, like the atom, it's mostly empty space. So if you really work it out, um, the orbit itself takes about 10 million years, which already tells you the density is very low. And the time before one star comes really close to another star, so much as to deflect it from its orbit, is about 10 to 100 orbits, right? So we are safe for about 100 million years, which would be fine, except that globular clusters are about 10 billion years old, OK? So in there, I mean, as old as our galaxy, and a little younger than the universe. So that really means that on the short term, you can describe globular clusters by these smooth orbits. In the long term, you have to worry about collisions. Now, these are not physical collisions. But two stars come near each other, they swing around, and they take off in different directions. And that is a random process. Uh, interestingly, one of the people who contributed majorly to uh, studying this random process is the famous Indian origin astrophysicist, uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. One of his books is actually called Stellar Dynamics. He wrote it in the 1940s. It was his second book. <laughs> the first book was on his Nobel Prize winning discovery, Stellar Structure. Okay? So what do these encounters do? So in a gas, what they do is uh, they, first of all, make the velocity go in all directions, which actually explains why these are globular. Even if they were not spherical in the beginning, you kick the velocities in all directions, and they would tend to become spherical. And uh, the second thing is you get a distribution of velocities. Right? I mean, some go faster, some go slower. The ones which are going really fast can escape. Remember the second version of the formula, which said that the typical kinetic energy is half the potential energy. But by random collision, something can gain this factor of 2 and escape. Okay? Now, this is a bit like uh, water evaporating from 
drop, it carries away energy, the rest of the drop cools. So in the same way, the globular cluster uh, loses energy because all these high energy people escape. Um, no analogy to a software company it ended. <laughs> okay. And the energy in the globular cluster becomes more negative. But now remember uh, that line that the kinetic energy is half the potential energy. So the potential energy becomes more negative. The kinetic energy actually increases in magnitude. Uh, this is not as crazy as you might think. If you think of uh, uh, a spacecraft spiraling into the Earth uh, because of friction in the Earth's atmosphere, it actually goes faster and faster as it comes in smaller and smaller orbits. So the strange thing about globular clusters is they cool in an energy sense, but the stars actually get hotter. And uh, gravitational systems are unique systems which have this uh, property. It has serious consequences. Over 10 billion years, many globular clusters actually undergo this process of loss of stars. I mean, they have plenty of stars to lose, but also collapse. Okay, And uh, evidence is uh, obtained. Uh, Chandrasekhar himself worked out these frictional processes and so on. So this is a very interesting aspect of globular clusters. And in, there's evidence for it in the center. And what might be even more interesting is that the same phenomenon can occur even on the scale of three stars. If you have three stars, the preferred option is that one gets kicked out and the remaining two get more tightly bound to each other. Okay? So I'm not going to give you a course on galaxies. 101 is actually the name of this galaxy. <laughs> it's called Messier 101. Um, it's a strange thing that in astronomy, we know more about other galaxies than our own. <laughs> because we happen to live in our own galaxy. We see it edge on. We see everything obscured. It's sort of interesting that the pollutants in our galaxy are pretty much the same as the pollutants in Bangalore. Okay? It's, it's called interstellar dust. Uh, you can see evidence of interstellar dust, these dark, dark patches and so on. The dark patches in the Milky Way in those beautiful photographs outside. And uh, they're either made of carbon, which is just like what the automobiles emit, or silicate, which is what the builders emit. Okay? So this is M101, uh, a pretty big galaxy, bigger than ours. I'll just show you one more. And now you notice it looks elliptical. So now it is a case where, you know, most of the galaxies of this kind, the spiral galaxies, uh, have an elliptical outline, and some of them have a circular outline. So now you can do a little bit of statistics and convince yourself that these are not spheres, they are disks. Okay, so these are also called disk galaxies. And I uh, picked this particular one, called 6944 because uh, apparently it's the one that resembles our galaxy the most, according to experts on galaxies. Uh, you can see that it's going to be pretty difficult to model such galaxies with their beautiful patterns of spiral arms and so on. Um, but the one good thing is that the stars move in almost circular orbits in this, within the disk. Okay? So we'll uh, look at one more kind of galaxy, which is actually the more common kind of galaxy. It's called an elliptical galaxy. At first sight, it looks like the globular cluster. If you look carefully, however, it's quite uh, distorted. Uh, and again, viewing an uh, el elliptical object, ellipsoidal object, from a particular angle might make it look circular. But you can never have the other thing. A spherical object will never look elliptical. So these galaxies are genuinely elliptical. Uh, the number of stars has gone up from less than a million to a million times that. Uh, so these are giant elliptical galaxies. The number of stars is 10 times the number of stars in our galaxy. But interestingly, in this case, the stars move in three dimensions. Um, but uh, again, a little bit of a paradox. The more stars you have, the less the chances of the collisional processes that I described. And if you think about it, uh, the collisions occur because the mass density is uh, not smooth. It's grainy. And obviously, if you put in more stars, the graininess uh, goes down. So that's a simple explanation. Uh, the Chandrasekhar formula explains it more clearly. But basically, by the time you come to uh, this number of stars, you can essentially forget about these uh, random processes I told you about and work with orbits. And this is exactly what uh, the Princeton professor I told you about did. He modeled elliptical galaxies very successfully. What holds galaxies together? Uh, gravity. <laughs> But gravity of what? And to initially, of course, uh, people did uh, simple-minded exercises. They counted the number of stars, or just counted the total light, assumed that each was 
either like the sun or a little heavier. They did accountancy for the mass and said, OK, so this is the kind of speed we expect stars to orbit in the galaxy. And then when they measured the speed, it more or less agreed, so everyone was happy in the 1960s. But the reason is that they were not studying the outermost parts of the galaxy. The outermost parts of the galaxy are the most difficult to study because there's not much there. Uh, I didn't mention how they measure the velocities of stars, but it's a well-known principle called the Doppler effect. Uh, the star has a spectrum. Uh, say it has uh, sodium, for example, which all of you are familiar with, sodium street lamps, which emit a particular wavelength. And if it's coming towards you, the wavelength is shifted to shorter wavelengths. And if it's going away from you, it's shifted to longer wavelengths. So you can actually measure the velocities of rotation in a galaxy. And so you can use that formula, which we had right up front, to find out the mass. So this is uh, the same formula, but the, it has a subtle but important change. Uh, I now have a little r. The reason is that we are studying uh, stars orbiting at different distances from the galaxy. The other thing is that, unlike the solar system, all the mass is not in the center. So as you have a bigger orbit, you enclose more mass. So the simple measurement of velocity, the simple 11th standard formula, actually tells you how you could measure the distribution of mass in the galaxy. Okay? But this was done properly only in the 1970s. And it proved conclu conclusively, and this was a big shock to astronomers and to the world of physics at large, by the middle 1980s, it was clear that in galaxies, what you see is not all there is. In fact, what you see is 10% of all there is. The mass which you infer from this formula, which is hard to contest, turns out to be roughly 10 times the mass that you can account for in stars. Okay? So I wish I could tell you what this remaining 90% of the mass is, but I cannot. <laughs> we know it's there. People have proposed various models, all of which have been shot down. Okay? The model which has not been shot down is it's some new kind of elementary particle which has not been discovered, which the LHC might discover. Okay? So this is what is called dark matter. And the interesting thing is the kind of matter that we are made of, which is all the elements in the periodic table, um, is only 10% <laughs> of the mass in galaxies, and the rest is this dark matter. Surely this is the discovery which so there are two mysteries about dark matter. One is, what is it? The second is, why is it that the person who discovered it has not yet won a Nobel Prize? OK, so here she is, OK, taken at the time when she was making these discoveries. She must be a, either a grandmother or great-grandmother by now. OK, and she's holding this uh, spectrograph, and that reveals the important role of instrumentation astronomy. Why didn't other people make these measurements? Because uh, she had the patience, and she had a very sensitive thing called an image tube spectrograph. Because today, every shoplifter CCD is more sensitive than this. But this was the 70s, right? And uh, to me, and to all astronomers, this is a great discovery. And it took others time to, dis to accept this. They said, OK, maybe something is wrong with the measurements, et cetera. So I certainly had to tell you about uh, this uh, pioneer. It turns out that the place where I worked for uh, 10 years uh, there are people studying dark matter with a slightly different tool. So uh, this is one place where uh, I'm mentioning work done in India, but there is a lot of work done in India. Uh, so Jairam Chengalur is a faculty member at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, one of my younger colleagues. Aisha Begum was his research student. And uh, she took up the study of what are called dwarf galaxies. And the world expert on dwarf galaxies was uh, Karachan Sev and uh, Srimati Karachan Sev, who naturally is called Karachan Seva. They have prepared an entire catalog of dwarf galaxies. Okay? And uh, they studied them with the Russian 6-meter telescope. But they did not study them with radio waves. So the collaboration was that uh, Aisha and Jairam studied them with radio waves with the giant meter wave radio telescope which is located in Pune, they're able to map out the hydrogen. It turns out that radio waves are very good for detecting hydrogen, even if that hydrogen is cold and has not formed stars. So uh, this galaxy is a bit of a record. People thought it was this big, and when the hydrogen was measured, it turned out to be this big. And they could measure the rotation. So a lot of the information on the rotation of galaxies and on the dark matter, including the dark matter in dwarf galaxies, actually uh, comes from these studies, and in fact, Aisha studied some 60 of them. 
for her thesis. I thought I should mention this. Okay. And uh, just like I showed you the instrument with which Vera Rubin measured dark matter, here is the instrument <laughs> with which uh, many studies have been done, the giant meter wave radio telescope. Um, these tiny antennas are actually 45 meters in diameter each, and there are 30 of them. You only see 11 in this picture. They are scattered over about 20 kilometers. Uh, what you see is the shadow of the hill from where this picture was taken. I had the privilege of working here for 10 years. It was one of the most exciting times of my life, with younger colleagues making a large number of discoveries. So I'd like to leave you with this picture and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Nitinan. That was enlightening and very, very exciting uh, lecture. Um, I would like to leave the floor open now for a few questions, if you have, for Professor. Sir, what is your take on, uh, sir, here. Sir, what is your take on life outside Earth? And if there are intelligent species outside, why haven't we been contacted yet, or why there are no connection till now? Mm. No, it's true, but I think he's given an interesting sidelight to it. Uh, before the discovery of these exoplanets, uh, the prospect of other civilizations and so on was more speculative. So it is the subject of science fiction. So in fact, it's a famous physicist called Enrico Fermi. He gave the following argument against uh, life elsewhere. He said, where are they? Which is exactly the question you asked. Why haven't they contacted us? Now, uh, it's, uh, and his argument in more detail was like this. We have had the cap capacity to build radio telescopes or you know, build computers, do all this advanced technology for maybe 100 years. Now, 100 years is a tiny fraction of the life of our planet, 4 billion years. So if at all there is any other civilization which has reached technological advancement, it would be incredible coincidence if they are also at the 100 year stage. They are probably at the, either they destroyed each other in a nuclear warfare or no, 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 this is a serious argument, I mean. <laughs> or uh, they are much more advanced than us. So once you accept that we are uh, the babies, so to speak, every other civilization which has managed to develop will be more advanced than us, they have the, it's better that we rely on their technology to contact us rather than our technology to contact them. So that is the argument, okay? Um, so one answer is maybe precisely because we are so, you know, retarded, they haven't contacted us. Sir, you said about dark matter, I assume, uh, what I have read that it constitutes around 20% of the universe and then there is dark energy also. And we do not know much about dark matter as of now. But that is one of the binding force of the universe. So do you expect that dark matter or dark energy would be surrounding here also all of us? Okay. <laughs> so let me take that. I did not mention dark energy because my talk stopped at the scale of galaxies. Okay? Um, if it was a longer talk there would have been a section in which now we would have blown up the scale even more and looked at different galaxies expanding away from each other. That's also governed by gravity. And a simple Newtonian picture would tell you that if it's traveling at some speed today, at a later time, it would be traveling more slowly because of the attraction. Now, what was discovered in the late uh, 20th and early 21st century is that uh, paradoxically the opposite is happening. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. And this is something which Newtonian gravity simply cannot explain. The simplest version of Einstein's gravity, which only has that capital G, cannot explain it either. But Einstein himself created an improved version where he had one more constant, and that can explain it. Interestingly, Einstein did not leave to see the, live to see this discovery, that this new term, so-called lambda term, uh, would explain the accelerated expansion. In some sense, it behaves like anti-gravity, right? It pushes things faster. Um, he called it the biggest mistake of his life. <laughs> it turns out that all the data on expansion of the universe are fitting this model very well, and that is called dark energy. So it's a very, very strange thing. And the people uh, who discovered dark energy instantly got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but I think dark matter also <laughs> deserves that. Now, dark matter is something more conventional. It obeys, it obeys normal laws of dynamics. You know, you can model it very well, but you just don't know what those particles are. <laughs> You have worked with uh, radio telescopes, so uh, I believe that greater the focal length, you can look behind in time. Is, is it true? 
Uh, no, it's not anything to do with the focal length of the telescope. What is true is that, uh, you see, it's an interesting fact about all of astronomy, not just radio astronomy. Uh, you can think of it as geography, right? You're mapping out the universe. But when you map out a distant object, the light left that object. If it is a billion light years away, it left a billion years ago. Okay? So therefore, uh, you're not only doing geography, you're doing history. All right? And this is nothing to do with the wavelength or the focal length. So long as uh, the information reached you by electromagnetic radiation or gravitational radiation or anything, you are looking into the past. So that statement is correct. Uh, it's not so much the focal length, but it's certainly the sensitivity. Because if you want to look more into the past, you have to look at a much more distant object. And therefore, the radiation will be much weaker by the time it reaches you for two reasons. One is the distance. The other is the expansion. And uh, it's sort of interesting, since you mentioned radio telescopes, something might emit radiation at infrared wavelengths. But by the time it comes all the way to you, because of the expansion of the universe, it may be shifted to radio. So a lot of the interesting things in radio astronomy come by picking up radiation which is emitted at shorter wavelengths and has got shifted. So what you really need is area, collecting area. So the GMRT, at the time it was built, had the maximum collecting area of 30,000 square meters. Today, a new telescope is being built, which will have an area of 1 million square kilometers. It will ultimately put the GMRT out of business, but fortunately, colleagues in the GMRT are also involved in that project. It's an international project called the Square Kilometer Array. And when they say square kilometer, they're not referring to the land size. They're referring to the total area of the antennas. I have tried searching for an article um, uh, on Google, but I was not able to get uh, the right answers. Uh, I read about something called antimatter, uh, which was invented by scientists, and it. Uh, what I understood, it took. Lo uh, it takes a lot of energy to create that, and we can use it uh, as an energy source uh, uh, for various kind of, uh, uh, you know, for example, an automotive or a spaceship. And so I wanted to understand your uh, insights on that. I, I wanted to know your insights on that. And also one more thing. Um, I also read about a concept of parallel universe, um, which again I was trying to understand, but it was not very clear to me if you can uh, enlighten us. Okay, there were two questions. Let me take the first one. Actually, you answered the first question yourself. You said it takes energy to create antimatter, and then it can be used as a source of energy. Okay, so purely theoretically, that's correct, but you have not gained anything. You have to expend energy. Of course, it's true that you, know, you might expend the energy in one place, in principle, you could store the antimatter and use it somewhere else. And that is no different from you know, burning coal in some place and getting electricity here. Okay? Now, uh, the use, uh, I, I wouldn't want it used in an automobile because uh, the energy is uh, released in the form of uh, gamma rays and so on, you know, extremely uh, energetic particles. So I think that is uh, complete speculation or maybe even science fiction. Uh, I don't know about a rocket. Maybe, maybe it's possible to imagine a rocket driven by antimatter. But clearly, you would have to, it's certainly true that it's the, most, uh, it's the most concentrated form of energy that there is. If you could get antimatter, the amount of energy you would get per gram would be greater than anything else. And it would be given by Einstein's formula of mc squared, right? So, uh, so that's true. But uh, I think uh, uh, the speculations are really just that. I, I don't think anyone is seriously working on antimatter as a uh, useful engineering source of energy. Yes, there is a theory of uh, multi multiple universes. Um, it's not a completely accepted theory. There is a group who believe it because the mathematics of string theory gives rise to it. They are looking for uh, consequences which could be measured. It, uh, by definition, you cannot observe the other universes because the definition of universe is everything you can observe. right? So if that theory succeeds in other ways, then the theory would be taken seriously. Uh, today, I would say not. But there are very bright people working on it, including uh, at least two or three Infosys awardees. <laughs> yeah, what is your take on uh, time dimension as exemplified in the movie Interstellar? <laughs> See, okay, Interstellar, I believe, huh? um, I had to confess that I only saw the initial part of the movie on Earth, which was sufficiently depressing that I stopped. <laughs> but I do know that the consultant to Interstellar was this world-famous astrophysicist called Kip Thorne. Um, since I myself learned relativity from a textbook written by Missner, Thorne, and Wheeler, I think uh, if he advised them, he must have got it right. <laughs> so what, what did they depict, actually, that time dimension? Whatever I have understood from the movie is that, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
basically like whatever happens now i mean if you okay, have okay. the capability it you can move in the future also and it will know what you are going to answer that's all okay so my understanding now from strictly a scientific perspective there is the theory of relativity including the theory of gravitation black holes and so on uh, it certainly allows you to view the past okay and in fact black holes uh, trap light so it, you know something nearby the light may go round and round and come in you may see something which happened long time back in the past uh, going to uh, the future is also possible if you uh, go at a sufficient speed then your clock runs slower and that is uh, einstein but it's not true that you can then come back <laughs> I mean that's my understanding of current physics, and and there are paradoxes if you could come back, you know, you could alter that future, as someone said, you could go and shoot your own grandfather, and then what would happen, <laughs> right? So I think uh, present day physics has not crossed that barrier. 